Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Officer of Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining the current installment of the monthly Dataversity webinar series, Real World Data Governance with Bob Seiner. Today, Bob will discuss a blueprint for data governance roles. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. If you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. And to note, Zoom defaults the chat to send to just the panelists, but you may absolutely switch that to network with everyone. For questions, we'll be collecting them by the Q&A section. And to find the chat and the Q&A panels, you can click those icons in the bottom middle of your screen to activate those features. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and any additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speaker for this series, Bob Seiner. Bob is the president and principal of KIK Consulting and Educational Services. Bob specializes in non-invasive data governance, data stewardship, and metadata management solutions. And, and with that, now I will turn the floor over to Bob to start his presentation. Hello and welcome. Hi, Shannon. Can you hear me okay? Sounds good. Okay, I always have that fear that I'm going to go through the first couple of slides, and I didn't take myself off mute. So I'm glad to be with everybody today. Glad that you took time out of your busy schedules to uh, to sit with us in today's webinar, whether you're attending live or you're listening to the recording. I always say that the topics that we present are very timely, and this one, a blueprint for data governance roles, is about as timely as, I mean, it's almost always timeless, should I say, because data governance roles play such an, a, a critical role in the success of your data governance program. So I'm going to talk about data, govern, about data governance roles as being the backbone of success within your program. And then we're going to go through what I consider to be a blueprint for successful roles in your program. So again, thank you for attending today. I'm looking forward to sharing some information on the subject with you. Before I get started, I want to just share a couple pieces of information about some things that I am working on or places that I will be. Um, as you know, this webinar series takes place on the third Thursday of every month. Next month, another great su subject, the metadata, is man metadata management's impact on data governance. So we'll be talking about how um, data governance programs really rely on having good metadata in order for people to um, gravitate towards the program. So we'll be talking about metadata management's impact on data governance in the month of April. Next week, I will be at EDW, Enterprise Data World in Orlando, Florida, giving a three-hour session on activating data governance and data stewardship roles. Um, so a similar subject, but taking several hours to just go through the operating model and talk about how to take these roles from the definition that we're gonna talk about today into activating them, getting them involved in day-to-day -day processes within your organization. I talk a lot about non-invasive data governance. I've written a couple books on the subject. So please, if you're not familiar with the subject, go look them up and uh, let me know what you think. I've also done several learning plans through Dataversity. I'm gonna talk about this a little bit more at the end of this session as well, but there's one specifically on non-invasive data governance, one on metadata governance, one on business uh, glossaries, dictionaries, and data catalogs. So please go to dataversity.net and the training center. In fact, this is data month, data education month at Dataversity, so please, go and, and use KIKEDU or any of the discount codes that you can to, um, to acquire some of the online learning plans through Dataversity. Um, my consulting company is KIK Consulting and Educational Services. KIK stands for Knowledge is King, and I focus on knowledge transfer to my clients. And as I've always said in my spare time, I'm also a faculty member at Carnegie Mellon University here in my hometown of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, in their Chief Data Officer Executive Education Certificate Program. So what are we here to talk about today? Well, we're going to talk about a blueprint for data governance roles. So I want to lay out the topics that I'm going to walk through today. First thing that we're going to do is talk about the crucial roles that make up an operating model of roles and responsibilities. And these are the roles that are necessary to establish and to sustain a successful data governance program, whether you're following a non-invasive approach or a top-down command and control approach. You're going to need to define roles and responsibilities. So I want to go quickly through a series of roles that are important as we're building out our, our blueprint for data governance roles. 
Um, I want to also give you some insights into some of the responsibilities and some of the skills that are necessary at each of the different roles within your data governance program. Talk about strategies for how do we go about recognizing people into their roles. When I talk about the different approaches to data governance, I say the top down, the command and control approach, people are being assigned into roles. Uh, and when you're assigned something, it immediately feels like it's new and it's over and above. But I really want to talk about how do we go about recognizing people for what they already do, recognizing them into existing roles within your organization and within your governance program. I'm going to spend a little bit of time. I've provided some detailed slides about ways to align your governance roles with the most important things that are happening within your organization, the broader business objectives and initiatives taking place in your organization. And then I'm gonna wrap up the webinar by sharing with you some resources and templates and tools to use that will help you to build out your data governance roles and your data governance framework. So those are the things that we're gonna talk about today. I like to start the webinars by, talk, by just sharing with you the definitions that I use for some of the most important terms that we're gonna talk about today. And the first one being data governance. There's a lot of different definitions for the term data governance, but my definition is worded kind of harshly, or should I say it's it has a little bit of teeth behind it. And there's a reason for that, because I think that no matter what approach you take to data governance, however you're implementing governance within your program, at the end of the day, you need to execute and enforce authority over data. I had a conversation with a client earlier this week as we're putting a definition to data governance. They said, we can't use the words execution and enforcement. They wanna use the words like formalize and guide behavior. And that's all well and good, but at least for purposes of this webinar, I define, and, and for most topics I talk about, data governance is really the execution and enforcement of authority over the data. Because the government's not coming to us and telling us, you know, follow these rules if you'd like. They're telling us you need to follow these rules. You need to comply. At some point, you're going to even be able, need to be able to demonstrate to us that you're executing and enforcing authority over data. So that's why I word that strongly. Most of my clients cringe and select another definition, but I still come back to saying that we need to execute and enforce authority over data. Stewardship, I'm gonna be talking a lot about stewards today. I've often said, and I'm sure I'll say it during the course of this webinar, that potentially everybody in the organization that has a relationship to the data as a definer or a producer or a user of that data, that if they're being held accountable for how they define, produce, and use data, they're stewards. It's not something that they can opt into or opt out of. You're not going to point at half of a room that uses sensitive data and say, okay, this half, you need to protect that data. If it's sensitive, based on their people's relationship to that sensitive data, they're a steward of the data. So again, not I've done complete webinars on that, but I just wanted to share with you that the stewards that I'm going to talk about today, these are people that most likely already exist within your organization that already have some relationship to the data, perhaps as a subject matter expert. So steward is a very important term for today. I provide a kind of a broad brush definition of what data management is, but I also want to talk about what a blueprint is because this webinar is, is called a blueprint for data governance roles. So it's really a detailed plan or a design for something. And in this case, it is a detailed plan or a design for data governance roles. You may not use the framework exactly the way I'm sharing it with you. You may alter the... Um, the operating model to match your organization. In fact, that's the ideal thing to do. I just want to give you some ideas as to what the roles may be that if you're setting up a blueprint for data governance roles within your organization, these are some things that you might want to consider. So the first thing that I'm going to do, the first topic for today really is the crucial roles that are necessary to not only establish your program, but sustain a program because there's a lot of programs that have started and have a short shelf life, so to speak. The idea of having calling it a data governance program rather than a project is that it's gonna last forever. So you need to be able to sustain your program. So if you're gonna sustain your program, 
you're going to need to define a set of roles and responsibilities that are also going to be sustainable within your program. So I'm going to share my operating model. I'm going to share how it is truly the backbone of a successful governance program, as I stated before. We'll talk about the operating model in terms of a data governance framework that I share a lot and that I've been using a lot recently. Then I want to go level by level through the operating model and describe to you the responsibilities, who the people may be that fill these roles. And then we'll spend some time talking about establishing and sustaining this model for data governance roles. If you've attended my webinars in the past, you've seen diagrams like this, if not this exact diagram. In a nutshell, it is the blueprint for data for, for roles and responsibilities associated with the data governance program. So most organizations are set up in terms of having an executive layer. And again, a lot of this is going to depend on the size of your organization. They're going to have an executive layer, a strategic level. A lot of organizations have a data governance council. I'll talk about that a little bit here in a minute. The tactical level and the operational level are where the stewards come into play. And I talk a lot about the domain stewards or the subject matter experts of the data. We need to recognize who those people are. Like I said before, these people most likely already exist within your organization, but we need to notice who these domain stewards are, who the data stewards are. We also may want to record them somewhere. So let me, uh, first of all, let me blow up this diagram first. If you are not familiar with the diagram, just to give you a closer look at the different levels. I always go by the executive level, strategic, tactical, operational, and support levels. I've had several clients that have told me these aren't the way that we describe levels in our organization. They've flip-flopped the operational and the tactical. Again, this is just to give you an idea some considerations for setting up a blueprint for your data governance roles. So again, this should imitate or mimic what your organization looks like. But even in the smallest of organizations, they seem to have the executive level all the way down to the support level. So as we're talking about the blueprint for data governance roles, we need to go through each of these. And I will provide a, a hopefully detailed description for you as to what these roles, the role they play within your data governance program. Most of you or many of you within the data diversity community know who Len is. So I didn't even give Len's last name here, but I said that my friend Len, and that is Len Silverston of, uh, of Zen for Zen with Len fame. And Len will be at the EDW conference doing his typical Zen with Len event or session on Wednesday morning. But Len once told me that we shouldn't even call this discipline of data governance, data governance. We should call it people governance because it really refers to people's behavior. I've oftentimes, I'm, I'm not, I didn't include this in this webinar, but I refer to a data governance bill of rights where the word rights with, is within quotes. It's getting the right people involved at the right time for the right reason, doing the right thing with your data. And if we can get to a point where we can get people to follow the that data governance bill of rights, it really becomes, a, it, it's all about the discipline. It's all about the people discipline. And so um, Len said, we shouldn't even call this data governance. We should call it people governance. Um, the roles, as you'll see in a moment, they, they're a core component within the data governance framework that I share. Um, if you look up the term backbone in terms of a business definition, it is truly the fundamental infrastructure, the key resources, you know, what is going to support and what is going to enable your governance program to be successful. So the blueprint, the operating model of roles and responsibilities is really all about what people do. And, and it the roles and responsibilities play a role in every part of your program, from stewardship and governance activities to communications activities. And I'll share with you a communication plan here in a little bit to the formalization of processes, to the acceptance of governance within your organization and the advancement of literacy of people within your organization. Um, truly the business value that comes from a sustained data governance program comes from the people. So it's very important to define what your roles and responsibilities are gonna look like um, as part of your data governance program. And I'm guessing that most of you who have data governance programs, your operating model, or at least your set of roles and responsibilities 
you recognize it as being a backbone to your program because everything involves engaging people in activities. So I've been talking more and more about uh, uh, my data governance framework. Um, this is my data governance framework. I want to make it a little bit bigger for you to see as well. In this data governance framework, and in fact, there's going to be a new learning plan available through the Data Diversity Training Center soon that focuses on data governance frameworks. And I'm going to use this data governance framework as the basis for that learning plan. But typically, just to quickly describe it to you, across the top of this framework, there are the core components of a successful governance program. And this is not to say that these are the only six core components, because as I'll tell you in a minute, you know, I've talked to groups of people and asked them, is there anything missing? Do we need to add to these components? And there's there have been some suggestions. But then also down the left-hand side of the framework, that's how I typically suggest that an organization is set up, from the executive to the strategic, tactical, operational, and support. And at some point in time, you're going to want to know, for example, when you look at all those bridges between those core components at the top and the the levels down the side, you're going to want to know the data that's important to each of these different levels. You're going to want to know the role that each of these levels play, the processes that they're engaged in, how to communicate with these people. So again, this is typically it's this is typically viewed as being a framework. And in fact, in data diversity conferences recently, I've done a couple of tutorials where we started with a blank framework and we actually filled in the framework with what were the important roles? What were the important processes and communications? So this data governance framework is a good way to look at what's going to be necessary for your data governance program. I want to give you a little bit of a history on this as well. Um, the framework, as you see it now, the way it looked 10 years ago is there was no data column. So again, this framework, just as it's working for me, it's evolving for me as I'm working with clients and finding what's important if you implement something like this, it can evolve to you as well. And just to give you some examples, I had one organization or I had a group of people actually tell me that there should be an administrative level of the framework because we need to know from an administrative perspective, what are the roles? And I'll talk about that a little bit as we go through the webinar today, even from a process perspective, what are the administrative roles? I've had people tell me that I should add a column for business value. Again, this is a framework that can be used, that can be customized to your needs within your organization. What we're going to focus on today is those roles, the blueprint, again, being those roles of responsibility, uh, roles and responsibility. And I'm going to go through it from each of the different levels perspective as to what do we need? What should we expect out of our executives, strategic folks, all the way down to the support level of your organization? So as I said, I, I want to go through it level by level. And just to kind of paint it with a, a pretty broad brush here, at the executive level, that's typically where leadership of the organization fits in. That's typically where you have a steering committee. Do you need to stand up a separate steering committee specifically for data governance? The answer is maybe. And the answer is it all depends on your organization. I've always considered it a win if we were able to get data governance to be a topic on existing steering committee meeting uh, agendas, just to get data governance brought up as a topic with that level individuals, that, that level folks within the organization. And then there's the, so the, the typical at the executive level, there's a steering committee. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. At the strategic level, the most common name that's given to a group or a committee at that level is the data governance council or data governance board or data governance committee. Again, it all depends on how some of these terms are used within your organization. Um, I'll talk again about what the responsibilities are, what some of the skills and who some of the people are that should be part of that. At the tactical level, that's where we start breaking down silos within the organization. That's where there are individuals or even small groups of people that are considered to be data domain stewards. They, they have knowledge around a specific subject area of data, and they're involved in facilitating to decisions that are being made at the tactical level. Again, this is a cross business unit rather than at the operational level, those data stewards, they're within a business unit. So the people at the tactical level, 
typically for a governance program to be successful, they have some level of, of subject matter expertise or knowledge, or maybe even levels of authority across the entire organization. So a tactical domain steward could have the authority to make decisions and, and make it such that we don't need to take all these decisions to the data governance council. The buck basically stops at the tactical level. And then, like I said, there's the operational level. These are people that define, produce, and use data as part of their job. As I mentioned earlier in this webinar, if they're being held formally accountable for how they define, produce, and use data, they're stewards of the data. And the, the data stewards and the tactical domain stewards, they need to be incorporated into the blueprint of any successful set of roles and responsibilities around data governance. You may notice that I missed one of the levels here on this diagram, and I want to talk about them specifically because I think they get overlooked quite a bit, and that is the support level. So we know from a business perspective, everybody that exists within that pyramid piece of the diagram that I shared with you, those are typically business people. But then there's also the sidebar, the support level, and that includes in typically the people that have responsibility for administering your program. It includes IT. It includes all the different partners that you may have for data governance across the organization. So the first question I'd be asking if I were you is, who are the data governance partners? And basically the way I define what a data governance partner is, and this includes IT falls into this data governance partner category, is that it's any group in the organization already that actively governs something. There's an information security group. There's a risk management group. Even finance governs organizational finance. Human resources govern human resources within the organization, even all the way down to corporate communications and customer service. The truth is that the data governance program does not want to replicate the governance of the things that these partner groups are doing, but these partner groups should work hand in hand. They should work as partners to data governance and help us to recognize who the people are in the organization that have accountability for data that need to have that accountability formalized. So again, this is just kind of a blown out version of that pyramid diagram that I just shared, but I'm gonna go through it a little bit more uh, here in a couple minutes. So the, the real goal of, of establishing these roles is to establish and sustain your program. The roles and responsibilities for every engagement that I've ever worked on with a client, it becomes the backbone. It becomes the support of the entire governance program. And so in order to be successful with your program, number one, you need to define the roles. We're doing that today. If you haven't done it already, hopefully this will give you a good starting point. We need to communicate the roles to people. We need to get people in the organization to acknowledge that they're a steward, that they're a subject matter expert or a domain steward. Acknowledge that they're on the council or that they're a partner of data governance. But getting people to acknowledge what you're doing or what they're doing in terms of governance is really big because once they recognize themselves as being stewards or council members, they'll start taking the role more, uh, more seriously. We need to engage those roles. Once people acknowledge them, we need to promote the roles. We need to grow the roles in the organization. Most organizations don't start by implementing these data governance roles across the entire organization all at one time. So oftentimes that growth is incremental within the organization. And then in order to sustain a, a thriving program, we need to make certain that we continue to engage these roles. And again, it looks like there's lots of different roles. The one thing that I didn't share with that pyramid diagram is that I usually put the words exists or new or leverage next to each of the levels. Because in many organizations, that executive level, that executive steering committee, it already exists. That council or a group of people that are similar to the, the, the group that will make up your data governance council, they already exist. The subject matter experts, they already exist. You know, so again, as you're building out your program, the whole concept of being non-invasive is to recognize people that are doing these things and to help them to help the program to be more successful. So again, you're not going to hire people into all these roles. These people, 
especially if your organization has been around for some time, these people already exist within the organization. I wanna share some insights into some of these different levels. And I just wanna point you to a couple different resources here. I wrote an article that was published this month in TDAN uh, in the Data Administration Newsletter. It was called Give the Belt to the ELT. And so there's a, that's an acronym, BELT, and, and the ELT is the executive leadership team. I'll talk about that in a minute. I also wrote a column or wrote an article back in December and posted it in LinkedIn talking about seeing your data governance council. And again, C is a, an acronym, and we'll talk about that in a second. Talk about recognizing your stu stewards, you know, how important those roles of the partners I just described are. And then we'll talk about, uh, I'll just kind of overall share with you the, what I consider to be the blueprint of roles and responsibilities. So just to quickly summarize what I put in that article um, in, in TDAN this month, the acronym BELT stands for Buy-in, Empowerment, Leadership, and Transformation. That's typically what the executive leadership, what we require from our leadership. And in fact, when I do an assessment with my clients, the number one best practice 100% of the time has to do with executive leadership team buy-in, or should I say their support, sponsorship, and understanding. Because if they don't, if they're not bought into it, you're going to be spending more time just justifying your existence within the organization. So getting them to buy in is critical. So as part of the belt that we're giving to the ELT, buy in. We need to help them to have that commitment and support all the different levels of this opera of this blueprint for data governance roles. We need to enable the stakeholders. So we need, basically need to be able to empower the ELT to make decisions. If you're going to escalate things up through your strategic level to your executive level, and that doesn't happen all the time, but we need to empower these people at the executive level to make the hard decisions. Because we can't just agree to disagree. We can't neglect and not make decisions that need to be made. It doesn't, doesn't bode well for the quality and the trust that people have in the data. So empowerment is important. Leadership, you know, demonstrating long, strong leadership from that level, especially when it, where data is concerned. And the term transformation is being used everywhere. So we need people at the executive level to foster that culture that really truly drives, and I know you've probably heard this a million times before, but data as an asset. And, you know, I can't tell you that the how true that term or that expression data as a strategic asset is today as it was when somebody first said it. I mean, that is why organizations implement data management, data governance is because they want to get the most value around their data as an asset and they want to foster a culture of that. The article that I wrote uh, in terms of the data governance council and seeing your data governance council, well, we need to stand up this group that I'm going to talk about in a minute and tell you what are the specific responsibilities of the council. We need to stand that up and lay the groundwork. Um, we need to empower them as well with authority. In many organizations with that pyramid diagram that I shared, there's an arrow up the right-hand side of the diagram that basically decisions go from the operational, if it's just within a business area, to the tactical, if it's now embracing multiple business areas to that strategic level where the Data Governance Council resides. We need to empower the people at the council level to be able to make decisions for the organization. Very rarely decisions get taken up to the steering level that I just talked about. And we certainly need to engage our council as well. I find it easy to remember acronyms like BELT and C when it comes to getting people in the organization to understand some of the concepts that we're trying to share. You know, I mentioned this earlier that everybody in the organization is a data steward. I even said everybody is an organ, everybody is a data steward, get over it. Those organizations that have implemented governance across the entire organization are starting to understand that potentially everybody in the organization is a data steward. So if they have a relationship to the data and they define data as part of their job or produce data or use data, they're a steward. And we need to find a way to, to work with that and to get the stewards engaged. So recognizing people as data stewards, getting them to recognize themselves as data stewards is very important because 
basically everybody in the organization plays a role when it comes to your data. As I mentioned before, the partnerships are key. You can look across your organization. There are groups like IT that are already governing. They're governing things like the projects, the portfolios, the spending of the budget. So these are your partners. You don't want to re replicate what they do, and they certainly don't want to replicate what we do in terms of data governance. Um, and again, as I mentioned, the governing functions that already exist in the organization, project management is governing projects. IT, risk, finance, again, look for partners within your organization. And I can assure you that you'll find them. I, I can also assure you that you don't want to try to replicate what these groups are doing. Um, and this is the one slide that basically takes the framework on the left. And as you can see, it's drawing lines between the framework that I shared earlier and the different levels of roles and responsibility that are important when it comes to developing a blueprint for data governance roles. All right, so I'm gonna now, I'm, I know I'm gonna run out of time because I have 40 some slides and we're more than halfway through the, the session here. So I'm gonna go quickly through some of these, but what I would hope is that if you get a link to this webinar or you get copies of the slides, please refer back to them, especially if they're gonna help you as you lay out your, your governance program and the roles and responsibilities that are gonna be necessary within your program. So at the executive level, I wanted to share with you what are the typical responsibilities of that steering committee? Setting governance strategies and objectives, providing oversight, allocating resources. You know, I mentioned the first best practice, which is senior leadership supporting, sponsoring, and understanding. The second best practice almost always has to do with there need to be resources necessary in order for you to be successful with your governance program. So somebody needs to allocate those resources. Oftentimes, those resources need to come from the top of the organization. And the members of the, that executive steering committee, they're oftentimes the C-level in the organization, the CEO, CFO, CIO, even the CDO or CDAO. They might be the ones that are having the responsibility for kind of managing and facilitating the meetings that take place at the steering level. At the strategic level, again, I don't want to read through all of the examples of the, the responsibilities, but I'd love it if you would share it in the chat as to if you see responsibilities that I'm not including at the Data Governance Council level. I've, I've literally seen organizations with charters that were several pages long that defined the responsibilities of the Data Governance Council. Originally, I just had defining overarching data policies, but typically it's not the people at the council level that are defining these policies. Typically, they're being developed by those people that have responsibility for administering the program, and they're brought to the council for approval. So again, it depends on your organization. These aren't a perfect set of responsibilities, but this gives you an idea as to you know, what is what are we going to expect of the people that are at the strategic level of the organization? Typically, the people that make up a data governance are strategic representatives from key business functions. Also, they're typically driven by the data governance manager or administrator or leader. Oftentimes, these days, I'm finding that compliance officers, auditors are involved on the council as well. I've been known to say that the data auditors are your friend. I've been told by people, no, the auditors aren't your friend, but you can benefit from having a relationship to the auditors within your organization to know what is going to be looked for to, to give your program the blessing that it needs to move forward in a lot of situations. The tactical level, again, I wanted to just share with you the responsibilities and who the members of that tactical level are. I, ref I refer to them as data domain stewards, data subject matter experts, Again, these are the people that are coordinating and facilitating data-related activities across business functions. As I said before, at the tactical level, we're not talking about just within business functions, we're looking across business functions. So coordinating and facilitating activities across the functions, oftentimes these are the people that have the responsibility either for making decisions or escalating their decisions. Again, if you see along the right-hand side, of the pyramid that's down below, escalating from the tactical level to that strategic level that we just talked about. 
And basically, these are the ask yourself, who do I go to when I have a question about this or that or about making a decision around data? There are already people within your organization that are subject matter experts. If you take the command and control approach and you assign them the role of subject matter expert, they may look at you and ask you, where are they going to find the time to do that? If you assign them something new, but if you recognize them for what they already do, again, that's a more of a non-invasive or a less invasive approach. And being recognized has a positive connotation that goes along with it. So the tactical level roles and responsibilities are critical for your data governance blueprint or, or your blueprint of data governance roles. The operational level, the same thing. These are people that are ex executing day-to-day -day data management tasks within their functions. These are the people that are defining, producing, and using data within the organization, especially if they're being held formally accountable for the actions that they, that they, that they take. You know, I talked about the usage of sensitive information. Just based on the fact that somebody uses data that is classified in a way that it's sensitive to the organization, if they are expected to follow the rules associated with protecting that data, they're a steward of the data. It's not something that they can opt into or opt out of. But, you know, potentially, as I said before, everybody in the organization does something with data. And if they're being held formally accountable for what that something is, they're a steward. I think it's in our all in all of our best interest if we can get them to recognize themselves as being stewards, build out a data steward community of practice within your organization where data stewards can talk to each other, and then the last level within the the uh, the, the, pyr the pyramid diagram or the operating model is the support level, and as I mentioned before, the, there's partners already for governance throughout the entire organization. I guarantee you that if you're not in IT, you've got an IT group, you've got an information security group, you've got a finance group, an HR group, all of these folks are already governing something. As I said before, we don't wanna govern what they're governing, but we can learn from them and we can partner with them to make our program to really help them to understand that they're already governing and that data governance is just a function similar to human resource governance or to project management governance. It's just a different asset of the organization that needs to be governed. So the support level is extremely important. So in all of my webinars that I do, there always seems to be a very text laden, text intensive section of the webinar. And I'm gonna go through these slides quickly too, but I want it to be so that you can go back and you can refer to these slides because it's really important from an organizational success perspective, that we align the roles that we're defining within this blueprint for data governance with the broader things that are taking place within the organization. You know, the broadest bit, broader business objectives, the broader initiatives. So I'm just gonna walk through a, th a few of these and I just wanna focus on the things that I've underlined. As you'll see, there's a lot of text on the next several slides. So. When we go about one of the ways to align data governance roles with that broader objective, broader objectives and initiatives is to align the roles with the business strategy. So that, that ensures making certain that we get the people involved as they need to be involved in strategic planning and decision making. We need to articulate and communicate business value that governance brings in order to align the roles with the business strategy. Uh, we also need to integrate the roles and responsibilities with the business processes. Many organizations use RACI charts that are basically a way to cross-reference the roles that you have defined for your governance program with the steps that the program, that the, the tasks are, are that are taking place to complete whatever the function is that's being defined within the RACI. Training and awareness programs are also another way of being able to align the roles with business strategy. Aligning it with business performance metrics and, uh, and, and incentives within the organization is, again, another way to align governance roles with things that are already happening within your organization. Again, I, I said that these slides are kind of text intensive. I just want to kind of focus on those things that I've underlined to make this more, to make certain things jump off the page at you. One of the things that we need to do is we need to link the initiatives that we're involving people in their data governance roles 
with ways that we're measuring success in the organization. I have a client right now that is specifically focusing on their operating model and evaluating how effective that operating model has been to the organization. And what we've done is we've taken data quality matrix, data accessibility matrix, uh, metrics, and we've, we've linked them to what role do the different people within the operating model play as a, a way, again, to be able to link the data governance roles to the broader business objectives and initiatives within the organization. And again, integrating the achievements of governance-related KPIs into performance evaluations, involving governance leaders in strategic planning process. Again, these are different ways of being able to link these initiatives to the KPIs within your organization. Another way to align the business roles with a broader perspective is to integrate them into business process. As I mentioned before with the RACI matrix, you know, how do we define who's going to be responsible, who's going to be consulted, who are we going to, or who's going to be responsible, who's going to be accountable, who are we going to consult with, and who are we just going to inform on the decisions? We need to let, we need to work towards getting our stewards, our domain stewards, even potentially our, our partners engaged in business process. So integrating stewards into business process, we need to closely align with the daily, daily operations. We need to involve personnel in the design and review of the processes. All of these things are different steps that organizations can take to integrate the data governance roles into the business processes of the organization. Again, like I said, lots of text on these slides, but we can develop business process um, or should I say process-centric data policies, and we can leverage process improvement initiatives across the organization. Utilize our stewards, utilize the people that we've recognized for the role they already play with the data into these processes. Enhancing collaboration across the units. Um, as I mentioned before, the, the, the data governance council, the level at the strategic level, the top of the pyramid, so to speak, not the tower sticking out of the top, but the strategic level, we need to establish a cross-unit data governance council, which means that there's representatives from different business areas within the organization. We need to have projects where we pull people together through these communities of excellence, these communities of practice in the organization. So another way to enhance collaboration is to have joint projects that bring people from multiple business units together. A Developing a shared platform for data governance and the tools that can be used by people across the organization. Again, like I said, I didn't want to read each of these to you, but I wanted to give you an idea. And in fact, there's even one last section, which is how do we leverage the roles and responsibilities for compliance and agility within the organization? So that's explicitly including compliance responsibilities within the responsibilities that we've associated with each of these roles. Basically, we know that everybody in the organization needs to protect sensitive data. That's a given. So we need to integrate compliance into artificial intelligence, into any big data, master data, business intelligence initiatives that are going taking place within your organization. Don't consider compliance to be an afterthought. We need to build it into what we do. And the way that we're going to build it into what we do is by explicitly defining what roles as part of our data governance blueprint for data governance roles are going to be involved in those efforts. Aligning it in the data governance framework. I shared the framework earlier with you. You know, we want to make certain that we're aligning our data governance roles with our broader business objectives, but we're going to do that because we know that our broader business objectives and every initiative has a compliance and an agility piece of it. So again, I hope this, this text laid in part of the uh, the webinar was helpful to you. Please go back and look at it and see if there's things that you can, you can glean from it as you go and you start to develop your blueprint for data governance roles. The last thing that I want to talk about before I turn it over to Shannon to see if we have any questions today is just kind of go through some resources and templates and things that you can use when you're building out your data governance framework. And then especially as you're building out that one column of the framework, which is the data governance roles. So let's start with the framework itself. 
there's lots of articles that have been written on TDAN, not only from myself, but from other individuals about different data governance frameworks. Consider TDAN to be a resource for you to help you to understand the different data governance frameworks that exist. Um, look for the linked art and LinkedIn articles. I'm posting a couple articles a week. There's a white paper on non-invasive data governance that I think Shannon attaches to the email she sends out you know, a week after or a couple days after the webinar. Um, there's these webinars. There's the new learning plan that I mentioned that's going to go into detail as to how you might want to go about filling out this framework for your organizations. And I'm also thinking about doing a, a virtual seminar that talks specifically about the framework itself. The second resource is the operating model itself. And we went through this in a lot of detail. Now, like I said, the one thing that I did not include in the operating model, because the truth is when people look at the operating model, the first time they look at it, they think, geez, this thing is really bureaucratic. And then if you could highlight for them that we've already got an executive steering committee. So we put the word exists you can see where I'm pointing, or we have a group like the council that we can say that we're going to leverage, or that we know that these subject matter experts and the stewards in the organization, they may not recognize themselves as stewards yet, but they already exist. We recognize that these partners that I talked about earlier, they already exist, and somebody has to have the responsibility for running your program. So the truth is, this may look extremely bureaucratic, but the fact is, instead of trying to plug your organization into this operating model, I suggest exactly the opposite. Take this model and overlay it over what already exists with your organ within your organization. That's going to be a lot less invasive than trying to assign people into new roles. And again, there's TDAN articles, LinkedIn articles, a bunch of, of data diversity webinars on this subject. Um, I've talked about the operating model and the learning plans that I've provided through Dataversity. And again, I'm going to talk about this within the seminar. Um, one tool that I did not discuss during this session is the communication plan. Now, this is an eye test for you because I know it's very small, very difficult to read. So I wanted to blow it up a little bit to make it easier to read. It's still an eye test. So I'm going to actually try to blow it up even a little bit more. And you can see that across the communication plan, there are the different roles and responsibilities that I included in that blueprint for your data governance roles. And I also break the communications down into orientation communication, onboarding communication, and ongoing communication. In fact, there's a TDAN article called the three O's of data governance communication, and it is orientation, onboarding, and ongoing. But we need to be very clear. We can't communicate with all the different levels of our operating model, of our blueprint of roles in the same exact way. So when we get down to the onboarding, we're going to need to onboard the group separately or individually, potentially. And so we still need to know the messaging, the cadence, the delivery method, and the communication, who's going to be responsible for the, the development of these communication tools for each of these. And that, as I said, at some point in time, you're going to want to make certain that you're communicating effectively in order to sustain your program for a long period of time or hopefully forever. This is something that I really haven't shared with you yet. I have taken this framework that I shared with you within this webinar and I have digitized it. So look for announcements soon in terms of how you can be, get your hands on this digitized version of the non-invasive data governance framework. Again, reach out to me. It's not available yet, but if you're interested, it provides detailed information behind every block of the framework that I shared with you today. We went through the roles column, but you need to also do the same thing when it comes to processes and communications and metrics and tools. So I just wanted to let you know about the data governance uh, digital framework. And then also attached to the digital framework there's a list, I call it a digital resource database that includes articles that I've written, templates that I've created that are now cross-referenced with that framework. So again, if you're interested in a specific subject within the framework, you should be able to look into the digital resource database and find additional information that's been written by me or other people or other resources that will help you to understand how to build out your blueprint for data governance roles, but also understand how to build out the data governance framework for you. So I think I've took us exactly to 10 minutes before the hour. 
And I uh, just want to summarize real quickly what I've talked about. We went through the crucial roles that were necessary to establish and sustain your program. I gave some quick insights through some acronyms and some articles that have been written on the subject to help you to understand what skills are necessary at each role. Talked about practical strategies for recognizing these roles within your organization. I kind of quickly went through the ways to align these roles with the things that are most important to your organization. Please go through that section closer. Give it more time to understand what are some of the things that you can be doing to assure your data governance roles blueprint is going to be successful. And then the last thing I did was share the resources and the templates with you. So I hope this has been helpful to you. And with that, Shannon, do we have any questions today? We do, certainly, Bob. Thank you so much. And uh, people are asking if they can get uh, links to those resources, which we have some of. Um, don't know if we have. When, when they become them. available, I will make them available. Awesome. Okay, um, cool. Yeah, yeah. And just to answer the additional most, uh, the other most commonly asked question, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day uh, Monday for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording. Uh, so diving in here, Bob, you know, should data domain stewards in the tactical level be part of the strategic level representing data governance council? That's a great question. I mean, I have seen it work that way where in fact, they don't even call them data domain stewards. They actually end up referring to them as data owners. And I, it's kind of a pet peeve of mine. I don't like the term owner. I think it implies exactly the opposite of what steward implies. But I have seen people that they, I've seen organizations use the term data owner or data domain owner instead of data domain steward. And those people have resided at the strategic level. A lot of it depends on the size of your organization, the complexity of your organization. But again, I'm just sharing a model that you want that will help you to think about what needs to be done in your organization. I would not rule out having the tactical level stewards play a role at the, at the strategic level as well. In fact, some organizations have even drawn a dotted line in that operating model that I shared just to say that there could be some blend here between the tactical and the strategic level. Thanks for the question. Thanks for the answer. Perfect. So Bob, can you expand and provide more details comparing data ownership and stewardship? Wow. There was some, there was some conversation about this this week on LinkedIn. Um, ownership to me, first of all, like I said, I don't like the term because it implies that it is somebody actually owns this, that it they um, that it belongs to them and that they can make the decisions from it. So I shy away from using the term owner. Again, steward by definition is somebody in the organization that takes care of something for somebody else. If you're thinking about it in terms of a racy chart, you may consider the data owner to have an A under their name for they're ultimately accountable while the steward is more responsible for getting the work done. There's a lot of conversation around this, and um, you know some organizations use the term owner and steward interchangeably. Owner is usually the higher level role, which has accountability associated with it. Responsibility is the folks like you and me that roll our sleeves up and get the work done. That's probably the easiest way to describe it. Simple, I love it. Um, so, bump. Um uh, I was reflecting on the definition of data governance shared as an uh, execution and enforcement of authority over data, given the fact that it might not be easy to get people engaged with the data governance activities, what would be the best approach to promote data enablement strategies that show the value associated with this framework, though embedding it into their day-to-day -day operations? That's a great question. In fact, I wrote an article on TDAN, I believe, about that people not wanting to call this data governance and calling it data enablement. So um, I agree wholeheartedly that if you can build data governance into what people do and not make them feel as though it is something that they are doing because data governance tells us we need to do it and they fully understand why they're doing what's being asked, that you've won the data governance game. So it is really all about enablement I don't, I, since I feel very strongly about my definition of execution and enforcement of authority, you might not want to use those words in your definition, but at the end of the day, 
You're or in order to get things done, you're going to need to execute and enforce authority. You're going to need to execute and enforce authority over policy. Or people are just going to say, oh, we've got a policy. We don't need to follow it. It's just we know that it's there. Um, that you know, we need to really focus on the enablement. And you know, we may not define our, our data governance as execution and enforcement because that's frankly very scary to people. Um, we may talk about formalizing and guiding behavior because that's all about enabling the people as data stewards. Again, execution and enforcement. I can't tell you how many how many of my clients have actually cringed, literally cringed when they've seen that as the definition that I use. Because at the end of the day, that's what needs to be done. It doesn't matter if you take a command and control approach, a traditional, if you build it, they will come type of an approach or a non-invasive, which implies that we're already governing. All right, we've got five minutes left, so I'm going to slip in as many questions as I can here. Um, can you share your thoughts if data governance roles and organizations need to change uh, with the advent of accessible AI? Again, every webinar, there's always a question on AI. Um, yes, I do think that they need to evolve. I don't think it's going to change the organizational structure from having the levels that I spoke about, having the executive level all the way down to the operational, and then having the, the support levels. So I think that the business processes, I just had a conversation with somebody the other day when we focused on the metadata, the, the information about the data that's going to make the data more valuable, we need to be focusing on what is the metadata that's going to be necessary to AI enable the data? What are the steps of the process that need to evolve to make certain that we have full trust and confidence in the data that we're making available through artificial intelligence? So do I think it's going to play a role? Yes. Do I think it's going to change the way roles and responsibilities are? You know, I think you're going to find probably more heavy involvement from your information technology group. But I think it's going to change more in terms of process, the need for standards and policies, than it is the actual roles and responsibilities themselves. Awesome. Well, we've got under three minutes. I'm going to slip one more question in here. Should data stewardship be an official part of everyone's job role to increase data governance enablement within an organization? Yes. <laughs> I'm not going to answer with just yes, but yes. I mean, if if somebody in your organization plays a role with the data, they do something with the data, they define it as part of their job, and you want it to be defined in such a way that's going to improve its value and usability within the organization. If they produce the data and they're being held accountable for how they produce the data, they're a steward. They're, they're just basically because they're producing data or they're acquiring data from the outside. People are a steward of that data. If they use data, that's the no brainer. That's the one and people use data. So basically everybody in the organization in some capacity uses, defines, produces data as part of their job. If we can get them to recognize themselves as being accountable for how they define, produce and use the data, and we can have a program to do it, that is truly the only way that we're going to cover the entire breadth of the organization. Otherwise, you're going to be covering pockets. It's okay to cover pockets of the organization, but ultimately that's going to need to evolve or you're going to want it to evolve to your entire organization. Perfect, Bob. Thank you so much. And that is going to bring us to the top of the hour here. Thank you uh, to all of our attendees who've been so engaged in everything we do. We appreciate it. As always, you guys are the best. Bob, thank you so much for another great webinar. And again, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday for this webinar with links to the slides, links to the recording, um, as well as some of the resources that we have from Bob already. Bob, thank you. And I'll see you next week at EDW. Very good. Looking forward Hope to it. Hope to see a lot you. of you there. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thanks, all. Thanks, everybody.